let me welcome everybody. Uh, it's uh, one of the best things that can happen to a speaker is to have a crowded room like this. Although I'll tell you a little behind the scenes what goes through our mind when we get in front of a crowded room. We're thinking to ourselves, I better be good today or else. <laughs> so I'm going to do my very best to um, meet your expectations today. Uh, before I get started, just a couple of administrative things. Uh, first of all, my presentations have a lot of information. So with your permission, I'm going to ask you to withhold questions until the end of my presentation. I'll stay as long as you need me to for Q&A. And if there's another speaker coming in, which I don't think there is, but if there is, we'll go out in the hallway and I'll stick around as long as we have to. Uh, secondly, I had some handouts, uh, but not as many as people in this room. So the course outlines are coming down from the front. and There are some on the platform in the back. Uh, if you don't get one and you'd like one, just email me at alan, A-L-A-N, at thebluecollarinvestor.com, and I'll send you over a copy of the outline. And as far, as far as that goes, the PowerPoint as well. Uh, one last thing. Uh, I write a newsletter. I've been doing it every week now for the last 10 years. Uh, it's on articles on option selling, uh, trades either that I've executed in my account, my mom's account, members' accounts that represent uh, learning opportunities. So uh, these newsletters go out every Sunday morning, 10 a.m. Eastern time, and they're free. I know a lot of you are already receiving these newsletters, but for those of you who are not, I'm going to be passing out these uh, sign-up sheets. Just print your name and email address. Let me see if I can find some pens in here. Please print neatly, because for every hundred we get, there's three or four that we can't read. And you'll start receiving these newsletters every Sunday morning, 10 a.m. Eastern time. And when they get to the back, just please bring them up front at the end of my presentation. Thank you, guys. OK. So now we're going to start for real. My name is Alan Elman. I'm president of the Blue Collar Investor Corp. We're going to talk today about a conservative option selling strategy called covered call writing. We're going to cover information that will be basic in nature and some a little more advanced in nature. Now, this is the strategy that if you're considering starting out with options, this is where you should start. This is where I started back in the 1990s. From there, I tried other strategies. But I just kept coming back to this one because this is where I've made the most money. Now, that doesn't mean this is where you're going to end up. You may end up with a different strategy. But if you're starting out, this is absolutely where you should start out. This is the strategy that across the board with every broker, including our US government, we're permitted to use it in our self-directed IRA accounts. And that is because it is considered intuitive for retail investors and it's considered low risk. Now I'm saying low risk. Make sure you understood that I didn't say no risk. And uh, option strategies have a range of risk. And this is on the lower end. And that's why when you look in the brokerage levels of trading approval, covered call writing will always come in at the lowest level, the easiest to get approval for. Now, when we're selling covered calls, and we're specifically going to hone in today on blue chip stocks, stocks from the Dow 30, stocks from the S&P 500, I'm going to show you how to do that. And, uh, but you could use growth stocks as well, which is what I do in my covered call accounts. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about that. But the bulk of the presentation will be geared to uh, blue chip stocks. Now, the strategy goals is to generate cash flow. That's what covered call writing does. When we go online and we buy a stock, click execute, and then we sell the option, click execute, cash is generated into our brokerage account instantaneously. That is what the goal of covered call writing is, to generate a monthly cash flow. 
Now, we want to focus in this particular scenario on the best performing Dow 30 stocks and the best performing sectors in the S&P 500. And that's because these securities, a lot of retail investors just feel more comfortable using these as their underlying securities uh, because they're companies that we've heard of. They have a good history in terms of price reliability. They're cash rich companies. They're usually dividend bearing companies. So a lot of retail investors are more comfortable with these type of companies than with, let's say, the kind of growth companies that I use in my portfolio. Now, the disadvantage of using blue chip stocks is that because they are of a lower implied volatility, that means the price movement is more in a shorter trading range as opposed to some growth companies that have a wider trading range. The premiums that we generate when we sell our options are going to be lower than the premiums we receive from growth companies. So we're trading off less risky trades in return for lower premium, lower returns. But as you'll see, the returns can still be very impressive. Now, uh, I know our audiences always have some beginners, so we're going to start off with a few uh, definitions. There aren't a lot. And then we'll get into the meat and potatoes as to how to make money with covered call writing. Now, an option is a contract that allows the holder or the buyer of that contract, it gives them the right but not the obligation to buy or sell 100 shares of stock. So for every one options contract that we as covered call writers sell, we must first own 100 shares of the underlying security. Now, if we have 390 shares of IBM, we can only write three contracts. Now, if we buy 10 more shares, now we could write four contracts. So if we buy underlying securities for the purpose of writing covered calls, we always buy them in 100 share increments. Now, a call option, which is what we're focusing in on with today's presentation, gives the option buyer, not us, we're on the sell side, that guy over there, it gives him the right but not the obligation to buy our shares from us at a price that we determine, and that's called the strike price, by a date that we determine, and that's called the expiration date. And most options expire 4 p.m. Eastern time on the third Friday of the month. In return for undertaking that obligation, we are paid a cash premium that's dictated by the market. Now, a put option is the opposite of a call option. It gives the right to the option buyer, that guy over there, to sell their shares of stock to us if we sold the put. Now, we're going to focus today on selling covered calls. Next, I'm going to talk to you about the moneyness of an option. This is so important because 99.9% .9 of covered call writers only write one type of option. As a matter of fact, all the studies that I've seen done on covered call writing only focus in on one type of option known as the out of the money strike. And in the last presentation, the out of the money strike was defined as higher than the current market value. So we're going to get into that. But let's define these terms now. Uh, the out of the money, the most popular by far of all the covered call writing strike prices is higher than the current market value of the stock. So an example is, is we buy a stock at 28 and we agree to sell the 30 uh, strike price. So 28 and the 30 strike price is higher. That's called out of the money. Now an at the money strike price is pretty easy to understand. You buy a stock at 30 and you agree to sell it for 30. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, we actually get paid for that. That is the at the money strike. Now very closely related to that is the near the money strike. So if you buy a stock for $29.95, let's say, and you sell the 30 call, technically that 30 call is out of the money. It's a little bit higher than the current market value of the stock. However, it's so close that you'll see a lot of articles written calling these near the money. So when you see near the money, you know it's very, very close to an at the money strike. Now, the option that's almost never used and if you take away one thing today from this presentation, it's how and when to use the in-the-money strike. 
the in the money strike an example is you buy a stock for 32 and you agree to sell it for 30. Now, intuitively, a new newbie might say, well, why the heck would we do that? We're not crazy. The answer is the option premium that we receive when we sell that in the money strike is going to compensate us for that $2 we're going to lose on the stock because we bought it at 32 and we're contractually obligated to sell at 30. So it's going to compensate us for that $2 difference plus a little bit more. That little bit more is our initial profit. So the in the money strike is a strike that we're going to use, and I'll show you why in a minute. In bear market environments, when the market is very volatile, or when the chart technicals are mixed as opposed to all bullish. So one strike price does not fit all. And yet, in all the studies done on covered call writing, they only use the out of the money strike. And I would say 99% of covered call writers only use the out of the money strike. You should use that whenever possible, which is in neutral to bull markets. But there are certain market conditions, there are certain chart technicals when it's going to be to our advantage to use the in the money strike. And if you learn how to do this, and I promise you this, it's going to put cash in your pocket. So those are the definitions of the moneyness of call options. The final two are option premiums as they relate to the stock price. So remember I said, when we buy the stock, click, now we own the stock. Now we can sell the option. We look and see what option we're going to go, click, and we get cash into our account. That premium consists of intrinsic value plus time value. Now intrinsic value only applies to in the money strikes. For at the money strikes and out of the money strikes, there's only a time value component, only initial real time value profit. But if we sell an in the money strike, the example I gave was buying a stock at 32 and agreeing to sell it for 30. That means we're losing $2 on the stock side. So if we generated a premium of $3 when we sold that option, and if we counted that $3 as our profit, we will have grossly exaggerated our returns. And there's really no point to doing that. So what we have to do is we have to deduct the $2 of intrinsic value. That's the amount that the strike price is in the money. 32 is the stock. 30 is the strike price. It's in the money by $2. So we must deduct that, and that leaves our real initial time value profit of a dollar. Now for some good news. I have developed a calculator that will do all this math for you. So it'll deduct the intrinsic value component of an in-the-money strike, and it will let you know, you'll see it in action shortly, it will let you know what your real profit is, initial time value profit, that doesn't mean that's what you're going to end up with at the end of the contract month, it's what you're starting with. You can end up with more or you can end up with less. We'll discuss that. But that's your real initial time value profit. It'll let you know how much more you could make from share appreciation if you wrote an out of the money strike. So what your total opportunity is, both from premium of selling the option and from share appreciation if you wrote an added the money strike. And the calculator will also show you how much downside protection you have of that time value profit when you enter the trade. So at the end of the presentation today, I'm going to show you how you can all get free access to the basic Elman calculator, which will do all this math for you so you don't have to worry about the math. Now, the Dow 30, every time, every morning you turn on CNBC, you see that little ticker on the lower right, and it lists the Dow Jones Industrial Average, which is a price-weighted average. In other words, the companies that have a higher market cap are weighted more heavily uh, of the 30, 30 large publicly traded uh, companies in the United States. Now, um, it's a, an index that's used to gauge the health of the market, of the economy. And it was invented uh, back in 1896. So um, just by a show of hands, how many of you remember that day when they first came out with it? <laughs> oh, there's a few in the back. There's always somebody that raises their hand. <laughs> uh, OK, the S&P 500, though, is really 
when people say the market, how's the market doing? Nowadays, they're really talking about the S&P 500 because it consists of 500 of the largest com uh, companies in North America. This is the benchmark that we compare our returns to. So um, when people say, how is your portfolio performing? If you really want to know, compare it to what the market is doing. If the market is up 8% and you're up 8%, well, you don't have to go through, jump through hoops to do all this investing. Just buy a low uh, expense ratio broad market index fund and you'll match the market. So matching the market is not our goal at all. Our goal is beating the market. So beating the market means that we're going to be incurring some risk. So I don't care what anybody tells you. If you're looking to get higher than a risk-free return, which we all are, we wouldn't be here today, in other words, higher than treasuries, uh, then you're going to be incurring some risk. Our goal is to reduce and minimize that risk as much as we can by doing everything possible from a fundamental technical and common sense perspective to reduce our risk and become better than everybody else at this particular strategy. So uh, the S&P 500, once again, blue chip companies, uh, usually dividend bearing companies. We all know the names of these companies. And we're going to figure out a way to write covered calls on Dow 30 stocks and stocks in the S&P 500 and a lot of people say, well, you know, these are kind of boring stocks. The price movement isn't that dramatic with them. I don't really think we can make much money using these as underlying securities. And today I'm going to show you why I disagree with that. Now, the select sector spiders are ETF, exchange traded funds. For those of you not familiar with exchange traded funds, they are like mutual funds, so they're baskets of stocks that trade like a stock. So you can buy and sell them during the course of the day as opposed to mutual funds, which are finally priced at the end of a trading day. So they're like stocks, but they consist of a basket of stocks. The select sector spiders divide the S&P 500 into 10 different sector groups. And you can actually focus in on the best performing sectors within the S&P 500. So, the blue collar investor does a, every week does an analysis, a charting of these 10 select sector spiders compared to the movement of the S&P 500. And we select the three best of the 10, the three top performing select sector spiders. So in essence, what that means is if we own those three securities, we are not investing in the S&P 500 as a whole, but rather the top 30% of the S&P 500. And it'll consist of approximately ownership in 150 different stocks. So that's how we do it. We do the charting. It's a three-month charting. We do it every week. So if, if you're forced to close a position, uh, then you will have every week an updated charting of the select sector spiders. Here are the 10 select sector spiders. And you could see that uh, right now the XLK technology has been doing very well. The financials were doing well for a while, then went down, now they're back up a little bit. So you know how the institutional investors rotate from sector to sector. By doing this charting, you can actually see what direction they're going in. And the institutional investors are the ones that actually uh, determine how a stock is going to move. So I'm talking about mutual funds, hedge funds, banks, insurance companies, not you and me. Those are the guys that move the market. So by looking at the select sector spiders that are outperforming at any point in time, we're get jumping on board with the ones that are being favored also by the institutional investors. So let's now define covered call writing. I've kind of done it a little bit before, but let's just review the three words in the term covered call writing. Covered means that we bought the stock first. We know our cost basis. So let me give you an example of being covered and uncovered. We buy a stock at, th at 28. We sell the 30 out of the money call. And over the course of the contract month, the price of the stock goes to 50. All right, I'm exaggerating now, but I'm making a point. It goes to 50. Now, the option buyer, that guy over there, is going to exercise buy our shares at 30 
and turn around, sell it at market at 50 and make a huge profit. But it doesn't hurt us because at, we bought it at 28. We know our cost basis. We've made about a 7, 8% one month return. Now, let's say we were uncovered and we just sold the option. So we sold the 30 call option, and lo and behold, the price goes to 50. Now what happens? Well, we are contractually obligated to provide those shares at 30. So we have to now turn around, buy the shares at 50 at market, and sell it at 30 and take a huge loss. That's naked options trading. Stay away. The second word, call, that's the type of option we're selling. We're selling the right for that guy over there, but not the obligation, to buy our shares at a price that we determine, called the strike price, by a date that we determine, called the expiration date, and in return, the market will dictate what our premium is going to be. And finally, writing means that we are initiating the trade. We are selling the option. So we're opening a trade. On our trade execution form, it will say STO or sell to open. So we're initiating the trade, and that's known as writing the, writing the call option. Now, no matter what option strategy you decide to use, there are three required skills that you must master. Two is not good enough before you risk even one penny of your hard-earned money. First of all, what underlying stock or exchange-traded fund are we going to use? Now, let me tell you about one of the biggest mistakes that retail investors make when they select the stock for purposes of covered call writing. And I know this because I've had the good fortune to, to either speak with or email with thousands and thousands of covered call writers from all over the world. We have members in 89 countries outside the United States. And so, um, I know the mistakes that they make, and I was king of the mistakes back in the 90s when I started teaching myself this strategy. And that's how I learned all this, because nobody likes to lose money. So um, the biggest mistake is that covered call writers will select the stock based on the amount of premium they'll receive if they sell the call option on that particular stock, which means they're picking very risky stocks that have a very high implied volatility. The, the higher the vol volatility of the underlying stock, the greater the option premium is going to be. So people get enticed into buying that particular stock because they could make 10% in a month. Now, I'll tell you a quick story how I learned my lesson. Back in the 90s, there was a company, you've probably heard of it, called Taser. And they make the stun guns. So back in the 90s, they were doing these efficacy tests on these stun guns, and reports would come back positive, and what would happen? Boom, the price of the stock would go up. And then a report would come back negative, and boom, it would go down. So the implied volatility of that security was tremendous. And I took a look, and I could get 8% a month selling near the money calls on Taser. So I went out and bought way too much taser. Uh, I'm embarrassed to say how much I bought. Suffice it to say, it was a big mistake. And the reason I bought taser was not from a fundamental, technical, or common sense perspective. It was greed. I saw an opportunity to make quick, big money quickly. No such thing. So I did make my 6 to 8% a month as taser went from 36 down to 6, and I, I lost a fortune on taser. But I learned an important lesson, that you should not select the stock based on the amount of option premium you're going to receive. Here is my guideline as to how I know whether or not a stock is too risky. A lot of times people will say, well, do you look up the implied volatility? Do you know Vega? You don't need to do that. All you need to do is figure out what your monthly return, if you do weeklies, you do the weekly return, figure out what it's going to be for a near the money strike. My sweet spot, this is where I've had my greatest success, is to have an initial time value return, monthly time value return of 2 to 4 percent. That is my goal. In a bull market, in a strong bull market, I'll go as high as 6 percent. 
If I see 8%, have a nice life. I don't want anything to do with that security. Now, in my mom's account, she has a small covered call account. I trade ETFs, and I lower my range to 1% to 2% because I want her to have more conservative securities in her account. And every month, I'll call her up. And depending on how many I sold, hey, mom, you could take out another 600 this month. Uh, she goes, oh, that's so nice. And then she calls up the broker, and they transfer it into her checking account. So it's made a difference in her life. And she's not looking to get the kind of returns that I'm looking to get. So um, the stock selection should be based before you even look at the returns. How is that stock doing from a fundamental, technical, and common sense perspective? I'll explain that shortly. Option selection. I told you that everybody does the out of the money strike. You buy a stock at 28, you sell the 30 call. Why is that? An opportunity for two income streams in the same month with the same cash with the same stock. One from option premium, and the other from share appreciation from current market value up to the strike price. Can't go higher than that, but you can get up to the strike price. So you have an opportunity for two income streams. Now, I do want you to use the out of the money strike whenever possible. But when you have a bear and volatile market like we had not that long ago, you should be selling in the money strikes. Because with the in the money strike, you have that intrinsic value component the amount that the strike is lower than current market value. The example I gave is stock trading at 32, sold the 30 call for $3, right? So your break even is all the way down to 29. You have more downside protection. Your cost basis is lower when you're selling in the money strike. The disadvantage is you cannot participate in any share appreciation. But think about this. If you're taking advantage of the out of the money strikes in neutral to bull markets, and you're taking advantage of uh, in the money strikes in a bear or volatile market environment, aren't you doing the right thing for that particular moment in time? You know, it's like in the casino when you have an 11 and the dealer has a six, you double, you take a card and you double because in that environment your chances for success are that much greater. Same thing with covered call writing. One size does not fit all. Learn how and when to use the in the money strike. And finally, and this is another big weakness of retail investors, exit strategies or position management, big part of my books and DVD programs. Now, when I first started teaching myself these strategies back in the 90s, um, unfortunately for me, my books were not available back then. So I had to depend on other resources, and nobody talked about what happens if the price of the underlying security goes way down? What happens if it goes to the moon? What if there's an ex-dividend date? The previous speaker mentioned ex-dividend dates. Uh, and you don't want your shares sold early. Uh, what if the strike price is in the money as expiration is approaching and you don't want your shares sold? What do you do? You have to figure all this stuff out before you enter a trade. So these are the three required skills. If you're just starting out with options, trust me, this is not rocket science. I'm not any smarter than you are. I've just been doing this longer. You could learn how to do this in three to four months, become proficient at it, where you then have years and decades to generate cash into your brokerage account. And if you're doing it right, you should beat the market every single year. If you can't, then you should be in an index fund, period. Let me give you a preview example as to how covered call writing works. And we're going to start off here by buying 100 shares of stock, XYZ, at $48 a share. Remember, every one options contract has to have 100 shares of the underlying security. So our cost basis in this particular case is $4,800. Now, once we are in this covered or protected position, we are now free to sell the option. In this hypothetical, we'll sell the $50 call option out of the money, higher than current market value, and a typical premium would be $1.50 for the 100 shares, $150. Now, two things. You see, you notice here I'm not putting in commissions. A couple reasons. Number one, it's going to throw the math all off. And number two, I think you by now you know that commissions are coming way down. When I started back in the 90s, a typical trading commission 
could be anywhere from $50 to $200, believe it or not. A lot of you remember those days. Now, when you do an option sale like this, it could be anywhere from $2 to $7. So it's not going to make that much of a difference in the actual computations. Secondly, I gave you a number of, of $1.50. If that underlying security was more volatile than this hypothetical example, the premium would be higher. And if it was less volatile, the premium would be lower. So that said, the initial time value return, since there's not an intrinsic value component to this particular option, it's all time value, all initial profit. So our initial return then is on a cost basis of $4,800 is 3.1%. Now, if we could do that every month, it would annualize out to that 37% at the bottom. I'm not saying you're going to accomplish that, but just to give you a perspective in terms of annualizing, because most returns are put in those uh, terms, in annual returns. Now, at the end of the contract month, there are two possible major outcomes. Let's assume for a moment that the price of the stock does not supersede, let's go back here, 48, sell the added of money 50. Let's say it never goes higher than that $50 call. It stays under, all right? That guy over there that bought the option is not going to say, I'd love to have Allen's stock at 50, even though they're trading at market at 40, 48 or 49 or 49.99 or any number really under 50. It's not going to happen. The option expires worthless. We still own our shares. And now we're free to sell another call option for the following contract month, the Monday after the third Friday of the month. Now, the other possible major outcome is that the price of the stock does supersede, blows by the 50. Let's say it goes to 52. Well, that guy over there is going to opt to buy our shares at 50, turn around, sell it at market at 52, and make a profit. Now, that's that perspective. Let's look at it from our perspective. We generated a buck 50 on the sale of the option. Another $2 on the sale of the stock. Buy at 48, sell at 50. That's a total return of 350, which represents a 7.3% one month return, my sweet spot, one month options. And that annualizes out to that ridiculous number you see at the bottom of the screenshot there, 87%. So let me stop for a moment and state the obvious, something you already know. You're not going to get this kind of return on every position in your portfolio every month of the year. You already knew that. However, and this is a big however, every month you're going to see a couple of these. So you have to know how and when to use the out of the money strike. That goes under the skill of option selection. So if we have a neutral market with a chart that has all bullish indicators, I'm going out of the money. If it's a bearish or volatile market and chart technicals are mixed, we'll get into that in a minute, I'm going in the money. So I'm giving up upside potential in return for additional downside protection. Consider the intrinsic value component of an in the money strike as an insurance policy on our trade but it's different from every other insurance policy that we've ever had before. Because this one, we don't pay for. This one is paid for by that guy over there who bought our option. So again, learning how and when to use it. Now, one more thing. Let's say we're approaching expiration Friday. The strike price is in the money. It's lower than current market value. And we don't want our share sold. You can always buy back the option. So you have full control. You can buy back the option at any time prior to 4 p.m. Eastern time on the third Friday of the month, and your shares will not be sold. Now, that said, my personal, I, I will determine myself whether or not it pays for me to buy back that option. Because sometimes I'll buy back the option, keep the stock because I still love it, and sell the next month's option. That's called rolling the option. And that's part of the position management skill that I talked about before. I'll take questions at the end. Thank you. Um, what stocks are we going to select and how are we going to select them? 
Well, I've alluded to this a couple of times before, but let me go through them now. The first and foremost thing that I look at is a fundamental screening of the stocks. How are the sales and earnings growth coming? Why do I think this is so important? The reason is, is that this is important to the institutional investors. Once again, mutual funds, hedge funds, banks, insurance companies, they love stocks with strong fundamentals. And you know what? If they love them, I love them too. So we screen for stocks that have strong fundamentals. In my material, I explain precisely how I do that. And if you want to do it on your own, there are free sites that you could use for fundamental screening. One good one is finviz.com, where you, they have these free screeners. Uh, in one of my books that I, uh, Stock Investing for Students, which is used at several universities throughout the country, uh, goes through in detail how to use the FinViz screener for fundamental, technical, and other types of analysis. So we want elite performance from a fundamental perspective. Now take note, ladies and gentlemen, that I haven't looked at an options chain yet. I don't know what these stocks are going to return, and I don't want to know. It's too early. I don't want to know yet, because I want to make sure that I'm very structured in my strategy and that I will only have a watch list of elite performers before I even look at the option calculations. So the second thing is technical analysis. Now, that's a seminar unto itself. So let me just list the four parameters that I use. That doesn't mean these are the ones you should use. These are the ones that I've had success with for over two decades now, specifically for short-term option selling. It applies to both selling covered calls and selling cash secured puts. <clears throat> uh, number one, I use the 20-day and 100-day exponential moving averages. So a moving average will smooth out the price movement of a stock, and 20-day simulates a one-month options contract, and 100-day gives me a longer-term perspective. Now, exponential moving average simply means that more weight is given to the more recent prices. So if we, do, we have a one-month obligation, and that moving average is going to move, we don't want it to move real slow like we might if we had a long-term position, where people might use 50 and 200-day simple moving averages. We want to see that line moving quickly so we know what's up. So that's why I selected those. Now, I have two momentum indicators. And if these don't make any sense to you because you're not familiar with reading a price chart, <clears throat> I'm going to give you a quick lesson after I name them. The MACD histogram, and I use the 12, 26, and 9, the same as the previous speaker. And that's a momentum indicator. And the 9-day exponential moving average, which is subtracted from the MACD histogram, will basically give you a quicker movement of the MACD parameter. And the stochastic oscillator, which tells you where the price of that stock is today compared to the last 14 trading days. So there's a line there. And I, I confirm these and compare them with volume. So the higher the volume, the more these parameters are confirmed. And if the price of the stock is going up to the moon like this, and the volume is going down like that, that's called negative volume divergence. And it's a red flag that things might turn around. If I see that, I might opt for an in-the-money strike if I'm selling a covered call on that particular security. Now, let me get back for a moment to uh, the MACD histogram and the stochastic oscillator. Because I remember being so intimidated by these names. You should eventually understand the math behind these, these parameters. But for right now, this is what you need to know. All right? You don't have to write this down. Is that line going up or down? OK, lesson two. Is that line above or below 0? All right. Course closed. That's pretty much it. So when, once you get these parameters on a chart, and you just put in the ticker symbol, and you're using the same parameters each time, then it'll take you less than three seconds to go bullish or mixed, I'm going to go in the money. Or if it's all negative, you don't even want to use that particular stock. So technical analysis is the second screen. And finally, common sense principles. Things like, and this is very important, never, ever, ever sell an option, call or put, 
if there's an upcoming earnings report. Way too much risk. I got bopped over the head way too many times before I learned my lesson. So there are ways of circumnavigating around earnings reports. Another common sense principle, minimum trading volume. I like to use 250,000 shares per day. Some people like 500,000 shares per day. I find that if you go to 500 as your minimum threshold, you're going to be missing out on a lot of great covered call writing opportunities. But that just kind of gives you an example. Asset allocation is another one. And by the way, there are certain stocks that are banned totally from option selling. And at the end, when I show you how to get the free calculator, I'll let you know how to also get that file also. So these are stocks that should never be used under any circumstances. Now this just goes, shows you the screening process we use for our members. And the blue bar at the top shows you the uh, fundamental, technical, and common sense screens that we use. And then below that, you see the eligible securities. Where you see those in gold, that means there's an earnings report that month. Do not write the call until the report passes. And the one to the fifth column from the right tells you the earnings report date. The ones in the white cells and beyond that are all eligible. And then this is a report we also give in that same report to our members showing you the stocks that were eligible each week in the current contract. And the ones in bold are the ones that have the strongest technicals. The ones not in bold are still eligible but had mixed technical parameters. So how are we going to screen for the Dow 30? Well, what we want to do is we want to see Dow stocks that are performing the best. And so what we do is we screen all the Dow 30 stocks compared to the S&P 500. Right? And then we select the ones that have outperformed the S&P 500 in a three-month time frame, so in a near-month near time frame, and then in a one-year time frame. The only ones that make our report are the ones that have outperformed the S&P in both the three-month and the one-year time frames. We still have to avoid earnings reports for these Dow 30 stocks. And we're also going to talk to you about avoiding ex-dividend dates. Before I get into ex-dates, let me say this. The only time you want to avoid an ex-date is if it's really, really important to you not to have your shares sold early. Now, that would apply, for example, if you're writing calls on long-term buy and hold portfolios where you may have purchased these shares at a very low cost basis and, it, and not in sheltered accounts. And if the shares are sold, you may have some negative tax issues. All right. Otherwise, if you're in a sheltered account or if that particular stock doesn't have any meaning to you other than it's a means of generating cash flow, have my stock, please. Have a nice life. That means that you've maxed your trade. You got the premium, any share appreciation from purchase price to the out of the money strike. You got your cash back on the sale of the stock early. And maybe you could use that cash now to generate a second income stream in the same month with the same cash. So I love it if my shares are taken away early. It's just something that happens very, very rarely. But it can happen. All right, but if it's important to you not to have your shares sold, I'm going to show you how you can avoid that 99.9% .9 of the time. Nothing is 100% because there are a lot of retail investors out there that just make the wrong decisions. And that may end up in our account. OK, so how do we manage earnings reports? Because this is important no matter what kind of stock you're using. Just don't own the stock until the report passes. Once the report passes, then you could buy the stock. But you may already own the stock, and you may love the stock. So what do you do? Well, do not have an option in place when the report is due to be published. Do not. It's, you're capping the upside, and you're getting very little benefit to the downside. So do not do it. Most of the time, statistically speaking, you're going to make out OK by not capping it, because there are going to be more favorable surprises than disappointing ones. And that's because the last 10 years or so, companies have been muting guidance. Apple is notorious for this. So the expectations are a little bit lower. And then the report comes, and boom, we beat the expectations. We beat 
consensus. So more, more often than not, it's going to be to our advantage not to have that call in place. So don't own it. If you do own it, don't write the call until the report passes. Now, many of these blue chip stocks have weekly options associated with them, in addition to monthly options. Those are options that expire every single week. So let's say the earnings report is due out the third week of a four-week contract. Write a weekly, write a weekly, skip a week, write a weekly, and then go back to monthlies again. Okay, so that's how you can circumnavigate it if there are weeklies to be had also. Now, a great free site, a reliable free site for getting earnings information is earningswhispers.com. Uh, we've been using this for more than 10 years now. We found it to be very reliable. There are no sites that are 100% reliable. But uh, I haven't found a better one than this for earnings report dates. Here you see Microsoft uh, has an earnings report date of July 26th after market close. Okay, so you don't want to be, if you, you want to be out of your position, your, your option position, before the market closes that day. Now, what about ex-dividend dates? Okay, so we all have stocks that generate dividends. Now, there may be a guy out there, that guy over there, who bought our option that wants to capture our dividend. So what is he going to do? Exercise the option, own the shares, and then capture the dividend. Now, I'm like Karnak. I can tell you when that's going to happen, if it happens. That's right. Aren't you glad you came today? <laughs> Karnak says that it's going to happen the day before the ex-dividend date. That's when it's going to happen, if it happens. Now, in order for that to happen, oh, let me say this first. That is the main reason for early exercise. Otherwise, our options are almost never going to be exercised early. Uh, there are uh, several reasons for that. If you're interested, bring it up at Q&A and I'll tell you. But suffice it to say for right now, that options are almost never exercised early, and when it is, it's usually related to an ex-dividend date. It never, ever, ever makes financial sense for someone to exercise an option to capture a dividend. Never. Because they'd make more money by selling the option, then buying the stock, and capturing the dividend. Okay, just trust me on that. So what has to happen in order to get exercised early is some retail investor is going to have to make the mistake of exercising to capture the dividend, send that to their broker who sends it to the Options Clearing Corporation, who will then randomly distribute that exercise notice to one of its brokers, maybe ours. Then our broker will randomly distribute that exercise notice to one of its clients, could be us. That's what has, that series of events has to occur in order for our stock to be sold early. It almost never happens. But if it's critical to you to retain that stock because of potential tax issues, then you have to not have a call in place the day before the ex-dividend date. The ex-dividend date is not the date you get the dividend. It's not the date it's announced. It's the date you must own the shares to be eligible to capture the dividend. So. That guy over there, if he knows that, is going to do this the day before the X date. If he waits to the X date or beyond, he, he won't get the dividend. All right, so what we could do is, if the X date is in the first week of a four or five week contract, just wait for it to pass, then sell the option. We still will capture three to four weeks of time value profit. If the X date is later on in the contract, we're waiting until the date to pass will not leave us any time value profit for that contract month, then sell a two-month option. Skip over that month. Okay, so if the X date is 11-3 and expiration is 11-15, then skip November and write the December call. What that'll do is move the expiration of the contract far away from the X dividend date. Believe me, folks, hardly anybody knows this stuff. But I'm telling it to you in case, the rare case, that this may be important to your portfolio and so you won't suffer any tax issues. So either if it's early in the contract, sell it right after the X date. You could sell it on the X date or wait for the next day or sell a two-month option if it's later in the contract. 
Now, if there's weeklies for that stock, do the same thing. Sell weekly, sell weekly, skip a week, sell weekly, and move on from there. So you could do it the same way we circumnavigate it around earnings reports. A good, reliable, free site for ex-dividend date information is dividendinvestor.com. We've been using it for years. Here you see the XLK technology ETF. And on the right side of the screenshot, you see March 16th is the X date. You could write your call on March 16th or March 17th. I usually wait for the 17th. Don't ask me why. I worry about administrative things going on at our broker. So if it's important to somebody, I tell them to wait for the next day. But technically, you could write the call on the X date itself. It's too late for that guy over there to capture our uh, dividend. It also gives you information on the left side, like you see the yield, 1.29%, and the actual amount of the dividend, 89 cents. So a lot of good information on that site if X dividend dates are important to you. So here's what a blue chip report looks like for the Dow 30 stocks. And if you could see on the top, you could see that in the last three months, when I made this screenshot, the S&P was up 3%, and in the last year, 9%. All of the securities under that from the Dow 30 have outperformed in both time frames. For example, the very last row, Visa, was up 7% compared to 3 for the S&P 500, and for the year, 18% compared to 9% for the S&P 500. So these are the stocks that made our watch list for the Dow 30 stocks. We call that our blue chip report at that particular point in time. So what I did was, I went to an options chain, and I looked for out-of-the-money strikes for these particular securities to see if we can make any money writing covered calls on blue chip stocks. Now here's the Elman calculator in action. The blue cells on the left are information that you get from an options chain. And you could see the ticker symbol, the price of the stock, uh, the strike price, for example, Caterpillar at the top. Uh, we, the stock was 88.61, and we were looking at the 90 strike. And then the premium of $1.47. Now, once those blue cells are filled in, the white cells become populated. Now, you could see in the middle there, intrinsic value is blank because we didn't use any in-the-money strikes. In this particular hypothetical, we just used out-of-the-money strikes. And these are real-life option chain examples. I didn't make these numbers up. Uh, upside. That's the amount that we can gain from the current market value up to the strike price. So if we're looking at Caterpillar, $1.39 is the difference between $88.61 and the $90 strike. So OK, that said, oh, we also have a break-even column, which is always the price of the stock minus the entire premium. All right, that said, here's how it came out. The average one-month return, option premium only, averaged out to 1.6%. That annualizes out to 18.9%. That has nothing to do with the movement of the stock at this point in time. That's just option premium based on our investment, how much we paid for the stock. So it averaged out to 1.6%. Uh, now, the potential upside averaged out to 1.3%. That's the amount we could make if we, the price of the stock goes up to or beyond the strike price. That annual out, annualizes out to 15.2%. So there's an opportunity here for a 34.1% return, annualized return, using blue chip stocks. Now let me just state again, this is in an ideal world now, because the, we could make more or less. We could use our exit strategies, position management skills. It could be more or less. In a bull market, we're probably going to make more. In a neutral market, we're going to probably make close to this. And in a bear market, we're not going to be able to use added the money strikes, so we're going to make less. But even if you made half of this 34%, I'm sure if I took a poll of this audience, almost 100% would be happy with that. All right, so this just shows that even with blue chip stocks, you can make good money writing covered calls as long as you've mastered those three required skills. Now, what about the S&P 500 going back to select sector spiders that I alluded to earlier? We do the comparison chart of the S&P 500 in a three-month time frame. I, I don't want a long-term, 
I want to know what's going on over the last three months because we're only taking a one month obligation. What's going on here with these select sector spiders? And I don't want to use the whole index, I want to use the top third of the index. So earnings reports are no longer a factor because these don't issue earnings reports, they're baskets of stocks. But there are ex-dividend dates where dividends are distributed, so that could become a factor. So we're, we're looking to get the best performers over the last three months with the possibility of ex-dividend dates being a factor. Once again, does that say five minutes? Okay. That said five minutes, folks. Uh, I'll get through this as best I can. Um, so, uh, for me, ex-dividend dates don't matter at all. Um, but it might for you. So here's what the screen looks like. You could see XLK, XLB, XLE all outperformed the S&P, which is that light blue line on the bottom, which was 5%. The others range from 7 to 10%. Now, how much can we make? Well, we did the same type of analysis that I showed you before, and that came out to where we have an annualized potential return of 25%. Now, again, it could be more or less, depending on market conditions and the skills of the investor. But once again, if I took a, a, an analysis of this audience, you'd probably be very happy with half that on an annualized. Or Bernie Madoff had tons of people investing for his 12%. You know, in, interest, <laughs> right? All right. Bernie always gets a good laugh. Uh, all right. So summarizing, the game plan is education, paper trading, practice trading, and then you have years and decades to benefit. You must master the three required skills. Uh, those of you who have outlines, you, you could see that uh, my books and DVDs, uh, we're offering a 20% discount. It can only be done online because I don't have a booth here. Matter of fact, I'm heading for the airport after I leave here. I have other commitments. But if you want to go online, I held the number one slot on Amazon on both covered call writing and selling puts for 10 years now. I've had that number one slot. So all those books and DVDs and membership and everything are available at a 20% discount. This is our best covered call package. It's a complete encyclopedia. <clears throat> along with the DVD program. This is volume two of the complete encyclopedia. Each of those books took me four years to write. There is a ton of information based on my own trading experiences. I'm now 450 pages into volume three, which I expect to be published sometime late next year. Here's the student book that's being used at the University of Maryland, Ramapo College, and a lot of other schools across the country. It's not options. It's general investing, um, dollar cost averaging, dividend reinvestment, difference between ETFs and mutual funds, and so on. Basic finance, the book I'm most proud of. Here's my book on put selling, also number one on Amazon since it was published. There I am in my old New York home. And a book coming out in a couple weeks, uh, Covered Call Writing Alternative Strategies. If you look at the uh, bottom of the screenshot, okay, over here on your right. It's on portfolio overwriting, how to use covered call writing on long-term buy and hold portfolios. Uh, the collar strategy, speaking of Bernie, uh, the collar strategy is the one that Bernie pretended to be using. That's covered call writing and buying a protective put. He called it the split strike conversion strategy and everybody thought it was this magical strategy, but it was just the collar. That's all it was. The ironic part of all this is he could have made money. He could have made money for his people. Instead of pretending to, to make these trades, he actually could have made money. But what, what can I tell you? And the third one that, that this book is going to stress is the poor man's covered call, where instead of buying a stock, you buy a leaps option, a long-term option. So there are pros and cons to that. So that will be coming out in a couple of weeks. It's at the publisher right now. They're just doing the edits that I made on the proof. Here's the promo code, Vegas20. If you go online to the bluecollarinvestor.com slash store, you'll get a 20% discount at checkout on all the items available. That's good through the 18th. Now, let me just, before, before you uh, go, and I'll hang out for Q&A if they allow me to, otherwise out in the hall. Um, these are the free resources on my website. 
thebluecollarinvestor.com. I have business cards up here and in the back. Number one is the Google search tool. So I've written over 400 articles over the years, and you can access them. Let's say you want to know about technical analysis as it relates to covered call writing. Just put in technical analysis, and it'll come up with all the articles I wrote on that topic. It's a wonderful tool. Number two is a glossary of terms I used on covered call writing. Uh, number three are the free resources. Folks, that's where you're going to get the calculator. Free resources link. There's also a put calculator and the file on banned stocks that you can't use, and about 10 other files for free. Five or addition, uh, four additional videos. Uh, five are, um, oh, the S. Gallon videos in number four. Those uh, are video PowerPoints that I made in response to member questions. There's about 150 of them. We put 11 of them for free on the general site. The rest are available only to premium members.